Okay, Dave, uh, take it away. All right. Well, I've been uh, working on this layout in the basement for 39 years. So, um, but it's a small one. It's not, not, not really huge, but when we try and make it interesting anyway. And so what we're going to talk about today is um, steam engines and how to deal with them and you know, everybody goes out or a lot of people go out and then they build a nice big engine facility, but then they don't use it. So that's basically what we're going to talk about. And let's see. There we go. All right. You see that all right? Yep, perfect. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to cover is, you know, how do steam locomotives work? And for some people, this is going to be all that, but um, there are still some folks around that don't know. Um, uh, what common facilities are required? Um, what happens at each facility and when? Um, and what structures you might model and how to use them to enhance your operations? Um, so here we go. Um, this is one of the better illustrations I found for looking at how steam engine works. And uh, we'll sort of go through each, each, each part of this whole thing. Okay, let's start back here. You know, the tender coal and water. This one shows an auger feed um, stoker in it. Um, you know, that of course, is going to define the kind of coal that you put in that locomotive. So you're not going to put mine run coal in if you've got to do this, for instance. Um, um, you know, so there's there's the stoker. Um, and here's the firebox. And the all important crown sheet, you all heard about crown sheet failures. And that's if the water level goes below it. Okay, and you can see here's the water glass, and uh, you know so that's uh, that's basically what's going on. The ashes, the fire sits on top of a grate. The ashes drop into a pan, and you can you know manually drop the ashes or the whole fire if you need to. Um, further up in the boiler, um, these are the flues. So all the exhaust from the fire and all the heat goes right down these tubes and into the smoke box and then out. Um, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of tubes within the tubes and that's your superheater. Um, so what we're trying to do is to get that steam as hot as we can. Um, and here's the throttle. And so that ringing goes all the way back for you know for the engineer to operate um so the steam comes in this way and goes down to the cylinders now basically a steam engine has two engines one on each side and they are arranged so that they're a quarter turn apart and you all heard, make sure the drivers are in quarter. Well, this is so that you get four um, applications of steam to the pistons per revolution of the drivers. Okay, so um, in this particular one, um, the valve is up here and the piston is right here. So the piston drives the um, the main rod, which then turns turns the wheels. Um, yeah, this, this is where we talk about how that goes. Now this thing shifts back and forth and it applies to when it's in, in this position, it's exhausting. So the, um, the piston is still moving backwards and the exhaust gases are coming up and going out. And then what'll happen is this thing will move and then it will put steam on this side 
and push it back. And then the engine on the other side is doing the, the same thing, but it's one quarter turn apart. That's why you hear four chuffs per revolution. So um, different kinds of valves. You've seen the little square ones on top of the, um, the cylinders. That's a slide valve. And this is kind of how that looks. And, you know, here's the, here's the piston valve that we were just messing with. Just different. These are a little more efficient, we, they say. Okay, so running repairs are made in the local engine houses. And that would include returning the tires, refitting axle journal boxes and bearings, repairs to the valve and brake gear, installing new springs, Minor repairs, such as the replacement of stays. We'll talk about that. Um, boiler washes and boiler inspections. Um, if they have, if they discover. Okay. Uh, boiler inspections are something that you want to have to do. And um, the you know, the fire tubes and the flues have to be replaced periodically. Um, you get scale from the water and that's removed by chipping and suitable chipping tools. That's basically air operated chisels, essentially. You can imagine climbing inside the firebox and chipping this stuff away. Not exactly a quiet operation. Um, the different pieces are. Um, they're, they're liable to corrosion, pitting, cracking, grooving. Um, the corrosion takes the form of the uniform wasting of the plates. Essentially, they're wearing away. Um, and so you have to in, inspect it, and you're looking for cracks. Okay. Um, these are the stays and the stay bolts. You'll see the... the you know, sometimes I'll have to put a patch over it. This is how they do that. Um, and here's some pictures of broken stays and the kind of defects they get. It's interesting the, uh, that they, they test that by hitting them with a small hammer. Uh, yeah. And they do all this to prevent this. <laughs> uh, You know, so that's that's in 43. So, and this is what happens if you have a crown sheet failure. This area right here is where the cab used to be. Yeah. Okay. So, steam engines have they require different things. So, you got fuel, which it's whether it's coal, wood, or oil. Um, water, sand, lubrication of the parts, cleaning the fire, remove the ashes, daily, weekly, monthly mechanical service, periodic boiler inspections, and major repairs and overhauls. Um, there's all kinds of things that sort of get in the way of them. And, um, you know, so the size and the capacity of the tender may limit the distance between water stops and fuel stops. The size of the ash pan may dictate how often the ash pan must be emptied, and it could be different for each locomotive. Um, steeper grades or longer trains will increase the need for water and fuel. So it's pretty much dependent on the railroad itself on what kind of service that you're going to give the locomotives. Um, you could print these requirements on the back side of your locomotive card if you're using um, car card and waybills, you know, so that there's a, there's a reference for some of that stuff. Um, the other couple of questions is: Do you have enough water tanks out on the main line? Do you do you need coal or fuel facilities out there? Um, so generally speaking, where do you meet these requirements? Essentially, that's this is at the, the engine service facility, and this is basically what they look like. Um, 
obviously it's going to be different for each each railroad. Okay. This is the inbound track. And so what you're going to do is you have the ash pit is here. You can get water here, coal here, sand here, and this is a wash rack. Okay. When you're leaving, you'd come out this way and you can top all those things off when you're getting ready to move the locomotive. Um, other things that you might find out there, oil storage and mixing houses, a machine shop, um, a rip trap for repairs, a back shop building for major locomotive repairs, and you may have a boiler house for the engine house to provide steam for heat, steam for charging the boilers, and to run the machines in the machine shop. And you may have a yard office with crew locker rooms I mean, you can fill up your whole basement with just the engine facilities in the yard. Um, you know, so you got to keep it going. Here's the oil mixing house that I have on my railroad. Not a very big one, but it's still there. And it generates traffic to and fro. Um, here's the rip track. All it really is is a crane so that you can lift the um, lift, the, lift the car off its trucks and change them if you have to and so forth. Um, and here's the overall for mine. This distance from the, uh, from where the, the, the tracks join the, the lead all the way to the house is about five feet long. And um, so you can see all the pieces. And here's the ash pit, the sand house, the coaling station, watch rack is up there. So for inbound service, you have the arrival, you drop your train, you go to the ash pit, sand house, coaling tower, water tank, wash rack, and then it would go to either to the ready track or in the engine house. Um, outbound. You start with the locomotive, it goes to the water tank, coaling tower, sand house, pick up a train and you're off. Who assigns which locomotive to which train? Is that a management job or an operator job? Um, I don't know. Some people have this, have think that maybe we need to do that. Um, but you know, what are the criteria for doing that? Well, locomotives are available, passenger versus freight train priority, train class, size weight of the train, run the train in multiple sections, pro prototype operating practices you may look at. Uh, most layout owners perform this function on their own. So, um, but that's just something to consider. These three jobs you can simulate pretty well easily. Osler is the one that starts and maintains the fires in the locomotive boilers. Some people don't realize that when um, um, a steam engine comes off the line, they don't put the fire out necessarily, um, unless it's going into the house for repairs. Um, and even then, sometimes they don't drop the fire because uh, it takes a long time to start up, a, um, bring a, a locomotive up to full pressure. Anyway, um, there's a basic locomotive inspection before a run that the hostler does, um, lubricates it as required. And he's the one that generally moves the locomotive around out of the house, off the table to the ready track and that sort of thing. Now the engineer is gonna show up and he's gonna inspect his locomotive before accepting it for a run. He's responsible for the safe and correct operation of the locomotive while it's in his care. And then at the end of the run, he reports any items requiring service or repair um, at the end of the run in writing. So, um, and then you have the fireman. The fireman means maintenance of the fire in the firebox. He may, monitors the water level and makes sure that doesn't um, go low. 
and it'll assist the engineer with operations as required. And he may act as the, the front end brake. Um, depends. Um, here's a couple of ash handling facilities. I think this one is in, is in Renovo, PA. Um, and uh, so they've really got it um, mechanized at this point. Um, my ash pit is a little bit older. So I'm modeled in the 20s. So this one's left over from, you know, from the prior century. Um, and here's the facility in Renovo. This is their coaling station. And um, so you can see this pipe that you see right there is for sand. In a lot of these facilities, the really larger coaling bins have sand capability as well. Um, here's the, the big facility in East Altoona. This also has sand in it. Um, but on branch lines and short lines, it could be this simple. A pit underneath a hopper car and a conveyor to dump it into a locomotive. In the 19th century, it was even more primitive than that. Um, they essentially shoveled it into a bucket, swing the bucket over and dump it in the tender. So, um, so you know, on an outbound locomotive, here we have an H-class consolidation. So we, we pull up and we top off the call. Um, I thought it might be interesting to see, here's a guy putting sand into the, into the sandbox, into the dome. And uh, I don't know, so. And here's the, my sand house and the, the tower. Um, some of these, they actually blew the sand up through a pipe in the center and up, fill up these bins and then there's a pipe on each track so that you can um, dispense the into the locomotive. There's a little bit better picture of it. Um, and this is also the water plug. Real common to use these stand pipes. And um, so you don't have a necessarily have a wooden water tank right next to everything. You can have a much larger steel tank off to the side. Um, there's my water tank, so. And then you bring it up, fill it up with water and you're ready to go. Now, when you have a locomotive returning from a run, there, we drop the ashes and then refill the sand dome maybe. Um, fill the tender with, with coal and water. Anybody know why we do that? One of the things that has to happen is you've got to balance the locomotive on the turntable. And it's a whole lot easier to do that with a full load of coal and water. So, and then to the wash rack, clean it all up. And then to it, like I said, either to the ready track or to the, um, to the house. And here's the, Here's the wash rack on, on my model railroad. So you can see it's just pretty simple. It's a concrete pad on each side. And you've got these um, doors in the floor, which that's where the high pressure hoses are kept. And so then you pull them out and then they wash the locomotive with that. So then you put the locomotive on the turntable, center it, balance it and send it into the stalls. You know, so in an operator saying, you can have the operator assigned to handling locomotive as a hostler. I've seen that done on many model railroads. Um, so the engineers pick up their locomotive um, either from the ready track or whatever, but you get that interaction between the hostler and the, and the engine is one of the things you can do 
seen a lot of model railroads where you go in and you get assigned your train and you go pick it up and the whole train is already there. Locomotives are already on it and you go off. Um, so you don't see any of these, but it kind of makes it interesting to, uh, to do the service. Um, this way, you know, you could have your engineers pick up your locomotives and do the pre-service stops before picking up their train. Um, engineers could do the service stops at the end of the run and report any maintenance needs to the hostler. You can do that in writing. Make sure there are deliveries of freight cars to the coaling tower, to the sand house, ash pit. Um, good job for the yard switcher and it adds traffic. Um, and yeah, make sure there are water tanks out along the main line. Um, you could do set up a scheduled maintenance program. Um, I don't know, sounds like a good excuse to uh, increase the number of locomotives in your stable. Um, your crews may be used to having one in on the coal drag, but tonight it may be a different one, it may be a lighter engine, and it may, may be a, a pair of you know, consolidations, um, whatever. Um, you can plan this out or just make that decision when setting up the ops engine. Um, well, here's a water tank out on the main line. This is a water plug that's hooked to a signal bridge. Um, I thought this was at Catanning Point in Pennsylvania near the Horseshoe Curve, but I'm not sure. This is the coal wharf at Denholm, Pennsylvania. And you can see how the, the hopper cars are, go out over, over top and they put it and they can service all these tracks. I think it's, I think it's 10, car, 10 tracks wide, I think. Anyway, so you spent all that time and expense to build the roundhouse and the turntable, coaling tower, water tank, sand house, ash pit. Why not use their... Um, use them during the op session. Um, have any of you experienced operations like this that, that use that? For, uh, for his question, if you've got comments, make sure you've got your chat window open and put them in there and we'll go through those when Dave's all done. But right now, everybody's muted. Okay. Um, this is the yard on my model railroad. And you can see that, you know, so from here all the way back to this, to this lead, it's only about five feet long. And, uh, you know, so the yard, um, it's easy for a yard to overpower the whole railroad. So, you know, you got to kind of pick and choose what you're going to do. So you can see how big how big the yard is. I don't know if I put. No, I guess not. So there we go. Questions now. Uh, let me bring up the chat window real quick. Uh, let's see, Eric Heiser is asking, it would be useful to know timing required for each step for a typical small or large engine. So like how long it takes to. It's infinitely variable. It's going to depend on, uh, you know, how big the tender is, um, how much coal was left in it when you got there. I mean, you know, it's. Um, you know, the prototype is, is essentially preparing the locomotives well before they need them. So, okay. Uh, let's see. There was a question about, oh, Ken is saying five to 10 minutes for water or fuel. Um, Let's see, there was a question about how often are boilers inspected? Ken answered inspections every 30 days, boiler wash, 
clean tricocks and water glass valves, inspect crown sheet and plug. Other inspections are periodic set by federal rules. Every loco has an annual inspection. And I'm pretty sure that, it, I mean, obviously yours is a little bit different era than now, but the local uh, railroad museum that had a steam engine, I think they have to rebuild the boiler like to tear the whole thing apart. Is it every 10 years or 20 years? Um, I don't know what the federal regulations on that are, but that is a federal regulation for that. Yeah. No. I mean, that was only one of the things that put them under, but uh, I remember the steam engine ran when we first moved here and I never saw it again because they never had the money to, to do the rebuild. But uh, let's see, Bill, Bill Grierson, uh, let's see. Travers is saying, I don't see an inspection pit. How large did the terminal need to be before there would be a pit? Odds are the pits would be inside the house. Okay. On some of the bigger ones, um, the bigger yards, I mean, the, they hook one to the ready track. And so you actually had, had guys out there sitting in a hole when the locomotives go by. Okay, let's see. Ken is saying 1,472 operating days require tubes to remove, be removed and boiler shell to ultrasound tested for thickness. So, you know, um, so it's more the, the days versus the how old is it? So uh, Bill is asking, or Bill is saying, I run steam on a branch line, but there's a water tank halfway up the grade. Crews are required to stop for water there and it, at each end of the branch. Most steam model railroads I operated on do not have enough or maybe no water tanks, let alone requiring stop for water. I'm not sure why. Uh, I'll throw out that they didn't want to model that detail. <laughs> um, uh, there was another, I think it was Mark Dance, uh, who did one of our virtual meetups back a while ago, who has a whole, he had a whole system where when the engine came in, there were all the different steps you had to do in the engine facility. So sort of like what you're talking about here, Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were timings on it um, and so on. Um, as far as the water tanks, not enough water tanks, at what point did they start having the engines that could scoop on the run? Where they would put the scoop down and there'd be a water trough in the middle of the track? You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, track pants were, you know, there were there were a lot of them on many different railroads. Um, I know that the uh, the Pensy had them in the 19th century. So okay. some of those go back. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see them in the 1870s or 1880s. Okay. Uh, let's see. Burr is asking, do specific tracks and the roundhouses have specific tools available? So some tracks were for storage and repairs, some for more major repairs? Infinite variety, yes. Uh, yeah, you can do that. It, it, it would depend. Some, some roundhouses um, were literally for just for the storage of equipment, but um, some not. Odds are, the, uh, it's not like you'd have a dedicated stall for a particular locomotive. That really doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, somebody's, oh, there we go. Ken saying some, but not all tracks would have pits to allow lubricating driving box sellers. Yeah. All right. That's all the questions so far. So do you, do you want to continue or are you? Well, that's basically, the, you know, what I had to present. Okay. You know, we had, um, there's a lot, a lot of folks that just don't have the, um, you know, the knowledge base to, you know, to run some of that. And this is just a beginning. This, this subject is huge. It's absolutely monstrous. Yeah. You know? And how much of it you want to add into an operation is, is, 
going to be dependent on how much of your basement is full of yard and how sure, much is it. Sure. Uh, let's see a couple of couple more comments here. Some, but all not not all tracks would have pits to allow, or uh, at least one in larger roundhouses would have a drop table to remove a set of wheels and axle. Uh, Cal Sexsmith from up in Canada, a local roundhouse here had six cold tracks for storage and six hot tracks for repairs, i.e. heated. Um, don't forget the fire cleaning tools, rakes, slicers, and other tools to clean ashes out, usually hung on a rack, easily made from wire. Just the little details. Uh, any chance you could see the rip track slide again? Oh, let's see. Huh? I think maybe it was that, was it that first one where you had the, uh, the track plan? Oh, let's see. I might have blown past it. Uh, yeah. No, this was earlier than that. Uh, no, too far. There it is. There you go. Rich, is that the one you're looking for? You can just type your answer in the comments. Love the detail on that. It's a very, very cool scene. Well, one of the things that um, I saw, the I looked at the rip track you know, when I was in, in Altoona, and it, um, this is, this goes back to 1969 was the first visit I made to that, um, to that yard. And it, it spanned uh, three tracks so that you could, trucks and move them from track to track and um but that's basically all all it really was it was all done outside so uh there's a comment in the chat from tom um for those interested in the rebuilding of steam locomotives the santa fe world war ii era documentary has some interesting footage of the steam shop work so make sure you grab that link before the the chat disappears. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we'll go ahead and stop the recording.